Good morning. Um, my name is Remkes de Vries. Uh, I'll be your MC for today, Thank you. or at least this morning. Um, we are here. We are all here today because we love open source. Um, we're opening WordCamp Europe 2024 with a keynote, keynote that is near and dear to my heart, and I suspect uh, near and dear to your heart as well. This keynote is presented by two giants of the open source community, and I use these words very lightly, but also very heavy, because they are giants. Um, this keynote is also presented by two giants in the WordPress community. Juliet reinders Vollmer is an opinionated, passionate powerhouse with a very, very prolific portfolio of contributions to various high-profile open source projects. You will have used her work whenever you were doing something with WordPress. Yoast, the Falk, is the founder of Yoast, um, but who is now an open source investor or an investor into open source, however you would like to see it, um, with Amelia Capital, together with his wife, Marike van der Acht. Um, and he still develops open source software himself as well. Everyone, please welcome Joost and Juliette to the stage. Thank you for this introduction, Remkes. Yeah, now for us to live up to that. <laughs> Ciao tutti. <laughs> We're here. <laughs> Are you all ready for a work in Europe? <laughs> I, I didn't hear you. <laughs> Good. Right. So. We were talking about regex, weren't we? We, we, we? Yeah, regular expressions. Is that what you're all here for? No? Okay. Uh, okay. Now, we're going to talk about open source and sustainability, and maybe we should talk about why we are talking about this. Yeah. Well, I've been working in open source for about 20 years, probably more. And a lot of the time, I lived on the social minimum, didn't make any money of it, but I had a great life because I enjoyed what I did. So my, my story is probably the opposite. I, we did make some money. <laughs> um, but we're not going to talk about money that much, are we? No, I mean, we both, while we come from both different sides of the spectrum, we both see a problem with open source at the moment. And it's a problem which I think a lot of us see, but is not talked about, and that's why we want to talk about it today. So we're not here to appeal to your wallet. We are here to appeal to your business sense. That's what we're going to talk about for the next, well, I hope 40 minutes, maybe longer. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to know that open source is old. Older even than we are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, first open source software was released in 1953. This was people buying mainframes and getting the software along with the package. And, and they paid for those mainframes, and they paid for the software which was on those mainframes. And they were allowed to contribute to it and send those contributions back to the creators. So these were the people that started thinking about open source. Actually, if you see on these slides, this is uh, Eric Raymond and Bruce Behrens, were two of the founders of the, open source uh, of the open source community. And they talked about open source, and they weren't solving for sharing information. They were not talking about money. No, they were talking about collaboration, making things better for everyone. So everyone could benefit if you fixed something and you didn't keep it for yourself, you just shared it with uh, people. A community. Yeah. These people all had jobs and were paid for. Money was not their issue. They were thinking about the four freedoms of the GPL. Yeah. But those freedoms were about freedom. It wasn't about free as in money. Or beer. Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 it's, it's something insidious in the English language that those two words, freedom and free, are so close together. 
And, and people get confused by that. Freedom is not the same as free. So all of this was happening, and open source was very much an academic thing. And then it became the foundation for so much more. Literally everything. I mean, imagine for a moment, and I'm, I'm serious now. Imagine for a moment, look around you. What would happen if, with a click of a finger, open source would stop to exist? Think about this. Of all the people here, I think 80% wouldn't be here because planes wouldn't uh, fly anymore, cars wouldn't start anymore, trains wouldn't ride anymore, and even if your car did start because you have a really old model, your GPS wouldn't work anymore. So imagine a world without open source. You, people don't realize how pervasive open source has become. Over 90% of all software is now open source. And it's not just your computer. It's not just your phone. It's your kitchen appliances. It's, it's your dishwasher, your Philips Hue or whatever lights you have in your home. It's everything. It, it's that chip in your bank pass. So, as this was happening, something went wrong. We started relying on all this open source software, but we didn't really solve for the underlying problems of how to maintain all that in the long term. Basically, a lot of companies thought, oh, freedom means free, so let's just take the software and make a shitload of money off it. That's called exploitative capitalism. Remember that term because it's real. The quote on the slide is a, quote, is a real reply I'd gotten at some point after someone had proposed to fund a couple of projects. And this was the reply from you know, one of their six, seven-figure CEOs. My response to this is quite simple. Supermarkets still don't accept the gratitude of the community as payment for my shopping. Nor does your landlord or your bank for your mortgage. Um, this is a problem. So sustainable open source is not something that we have. It's something we have to create. And when talking about sustainability in terms of open source, we talk about the resources we use. And in open source software, the resource we use the most it's humans. It's people. And the weird thing about all of this is that then you get what Juliette very aptly calls the maintainer's paradox. Sometimes things just work. The thing about that is when things just work, people do not think about it. You know, any software you use which just works, you forget it exists until it tells you you've, you've been doing something wrong. But then when something doesn't work, even if it's only tiny, tiny, tiny parts which doesn't work, you start complaining and you don't want to fund it. So when things work, you don't think it needs funding. When things don't work, you don't want to fund it because, it doesn't hey, work. it doesn't work. And the problem we see is that we're getting older and we're not that old yet. I mean, we're very young, right? <laughs> but there's no new generation stepping up yet to take over these projects and to start helping the maintenance as enough, in our opinion. Yeah. And we're reaching the point that if we look in the next 10, 15 years, a lot of the original maintainers of open source are reaching pension age. And at some point, they do want to step back. We need the next generation to step up but they don't want to do it for free, and I don't blame them. And to explain to you how pervasive this is, maybe we should give you some examples of where it goes wrong. So, how many of you have ever heard of the XZ backdoor? I see a few hands. 
I'm not going to go deep into it, please Google it. But basically, this was most likely a state-sponsored attack, which could have added a backdoor to 98% of all servers worldwide. And it was caught by one person. Yep, noticing tiny performance decrease. So it was accidentally caught just in the nick of time. And these are attacks which built on the fact that a lot of open source maintainers are overworked, unpaid, need help. And if you then add social pressure, like literally so social engineering pressure to add more maintainers, something like this can happen. And this was more uh, several year plan, two, two, two and a half years to get this in attack in place. This is an orchestrated attack on open source, but it's happening. It's happening now. There's also examples that are a bit more, dare I say it, stupid. This is left bad. If you're a developer, you know what this does. It adds spaces to the left of, your, of whatever you're outputting. <coughs> this was used in so many programs. And then the developer decided to take it away. And a lot of dependency trees everywhere broke because people used this. And the developer was like, I'm done. Now, this is not going to happen that easily again because safeguards have been put in place, things have been learned. <laughs> All the same, why shouldn't that person have the right to say, I quit? And I don't know whether anyone knows the person in this slide, recognizes them. Anyone here? I can see two hands. This is the founder of Postgres SQL, which is an awesome database. Luckily, the Postgres project, project by now has a pool of maintainers. And this, this, the fact that this person died did not kill the project. But we can all think about things like this in the abstract and think like, yeah, but this is happening elsewhere. This doesn't happen to us. We've seen people die in the WordPress community. And let's, ma let's make this real. How many of you use the WordPress coding standards? OK, that's about half the room. All of you who use the WordPress coding standards use the Composer PHP CS plugin. I'm one of the maintainers of that. And luckily, we're with a team of three. I say three. But in reality, we're now two because one of us has been diagnosed with a terminal brain tumor. This is real. This is happening. And what makes it even more painful is the only reason I know about this is because the other two maintainers know each other in real life, and we have off GitHub contact. Because it's not really the kind of thing you put an issue up, like, by the way, I, I have to stop maintaining. I have a, t a brain tumor. So something like this, people can just fall away, drop away, and you wouldn't even know it's happening because there's no way to communicate about this on the platforms we use. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. This is the stuff we see and now hear about. Every dependency we have as the WordPress project has dependencies itself. Funnily enough, I'm not even worried that much about WordPress itself. I'm worried way more about all the dependencies. Let me give you an example. This is a non-exhaustive, simple view of like a couple of the dependencies that WordPress has. This is literally me going into the source code and looking, OK, what do, what do I see quickly? This looks like a lot of dependencies already, and you might already see things that you've never heard about. But the thing is that this tree is actually way bigger, and that we could do this forever. Like, I could make this thing go on and on and on and on, and we simply lack the time. Yeah. It's basically like, you know those videos where they zoom in on the sun and then zoom out, zoom out, zoom out until you see the whole universe? That's this. 
Um, there's this famous XKCD comic that you might have seen. The funny thing is that the project that someone has been thanklessly maintaining in Nebraska is actually something we rely on with WordPress as well, because it's image magic. But the reality is that this, in my opinion, this cartoon is wrong. You see that one little block which everything depends on. In reality, it's a thousand little blocks. And all of them as, as little as that. And all of them, you know, single maintainer or, or few maintainer projects. And if any of them get knocked over, everything would tumble down. So, we need to make open source more sustainable. And when I was making this slide, Juliette was sitting next to me and she said, this is not about green sustainability, so maybe this is not the right image. But maybe it's good to explain why yeah. and explain what the Cambridge Dictionary actually says about sustainable. Yeah, so I'm moving this way to make sure I actually quote the dictionary correctly. The dictionary says the quality of being able to continue over a period of time. That is what sustainability means. It basically means future-proofing the hell out of something. So, what does sustainability or sustainable mean in the context of open source? Let's talk about it. Let's go through what that means to us. Well, first, we have the bus factor. Um, everyone knows what the bus factor means? Not that many people put up their hands, so I'm going to explain it anyway. Basically, how many people do you need to put in a bus that if that bus crashes, the project or the company is dead? If the bus factor is one or, or zero, you have a serious problem. If the bus factor is 200 and you need several buses, you don't have that much of a problem. So Juliette can talk about this because she is the bus factor of one for quite a few projects that we all rely on. Um, this, this has related things. Who has the keys to the castle if that bus happens? Who can take over? Is there someone else who is admin to your repo? Is there someone else who has admin to funding platforms? Is there someone else who has the access to change the DNS of your domains? Just some examples. The list is not exhaustive, but there's far more to go through. One of our, all of our biggest dependencies is PHP. And the PHP Foundation was actually created with a problem like this in mind. Exactly. And basically, at some point, we reached the point that there were basically two persons in PHP who really, 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 really understood the internals. And one of them had said, I'm leaving. And that's when the uh, PHP Foundation was created, to help fund maintainers for the PHP project. But it's, it's something to think about. We are not the only project in the open source community that relies on PHP. The fact that, that, that we've reached the point where PHP is two people maintaining the thing should be scary to each and every one of you. Well, to grow the maintainer pool, you first have to make sure your project actually is inclusive, is welcoming to new contributors. I mean, if it's an in-company project or a project which is largely maintained by a company, that might be difficult because you use internal processes. It's not as easy for someone from outside to step in and actually start contributing. Then again, if it's a company and that company exists of multiple people, you might have some safeguards in place already. However, if you're not a company, it, it, it can still be, you know, a small group of people who do things via back channels. Make sure you open it up. Make sure there are good first issues. Make sure you show that the project is welcoming new contributors. This is why I'm not as worried about WordPress itself as I am about the dependencies, because you all are a lovely bunch, and we are usually very welcoming to new people. Definitely gotten better over the years. Yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> If you want new, uh, new contributors, though, you have to also be clear about your expectations. Yeah, what are the quality standards you expect people to work with? Where, what are typical issues they can start with? 
uh, what, what are your expectations of contributions to the project? Have you got a good contributor guide? Have you got good quality standards automated in place so people know what's expected? It is at that point also actually important to respond in time and to find a good balance between, we'll get to that later, having a life and actually responding quickly. I have to say yesterday during Contributor Day, I did a pull request on Jetpack and it was merged within two hours of me doing the pull request, which is worth an applause for that team. But it is, it, this is unique. Um, this doesn't re usually happen. Very often you do a pull request or you, you start an issue and you can wait. Yep. But the thing is, it, it's a balancing act. On the one hand, the maintainer wants to, well, often wants to look at your pull request. On the other hand, they need to find the time. And they may have other commitments, other paid, uh, paid jobs, uh, and don't have the time to look at it immediately. But for an, a contributor, it's very discouraging if they have to wait for six months to get a response, or even a year. And I, yeah, I do have pull requests open for more than a year. I have track tickets that have been open for eight years. I mean, <laughs> you probably do too. Yep. <laughs> um, at the same time, Juliette is here now, so she can't respond to tickets being created today on PHPCS. There is this reality where we all have to find balance. A public roadmap is also very important, but it's also scary. Yeah, you want people to know where you want to take the project. So as a maintainer, you need to show people the road you're taking, and that leaves room also for them to come up with ideas which fit into that roadmap. At the same time, you need to also be careful not to overpromise, because it's easy for people, when, when you publish a roadmap which is really ambitious and is multi-year, to then get really disgruntled when you don't live up to it. When you accept new maintainers, you also want a bit of a growth path for them. Yeah. You want to be clear on, hey, if you start contributing, what would we need for you to become a maintainer? And, and when we talk about maintainer and in the whole talk, we're not just talking about code maintainers and code project maintainers. We're talking about maintainers in the widest sense of the word. That can also be a documentation maintainer. It can also be a community maintainer. It can also be a marketing guru who helps the project get in the spotlight. Maintainer does not necessarily mean code. So the growth path can be all sorts of things as long as it's within that field which you're a maintainer in. And at the same time, as we do all this, we have to keep in mind work-life balance. Um, there are many, many things that I would encourage you to take Juliette as an example in. This is not one of them. <laughs> I have no life, do not be like me. <laughs> Uh, but it's good to realize that the person that's maintaining these, uh, uh, these projects, that these are people. And you have, to, you have to also realize that as the projects gets bigger, that it's very lonely at the top of a maintainer tree. Uh, the buck stops with you. You carry the responsibility. And if you take the wrong decision, it will damage the project. It might damage you. If you then correct quickly, then it might not damage it. But in the end, that responsibility is yours. And unless you have a multi-maintainer project, it's very lonely to take that responsibility on. So as we do all this, one of the things that's very important and, and something that I think we've actually done very well in WordPress is a publicly documented release process. You have to actually know if you take over how to release the software. Who here has, act has ever joined a WordPress release party? <coughs> More of you should join the WordPress release party. I really, really urge you to join. For, for, even for a minor version, just see the, follow the process along, 
go into the core channel, see what happens. It is one of the most glorious things to see when you're in the WordPress community to, to just in a Slack channel before you see everyone go through the rhythm and test and do all the steps that are needed. And it's, it's incredible to see. At the same time, a release process isn't the only thing to document. You can also document things like, do we accept deprecations, and if so, when? Or when will we drop support for a certain PHP version? Or when will we drop a certain dependency? If those things aren't documented and decided in back rooms, it makes the project a lot less transparent and a lot um, less easy to get involved with. And this is where we talk about money. There's a very big difference between someone who's fully funded as a maintainer to work on something and projects that have no or too limited funding. You know this all too well. Um, Shiliat has been doing this for a long time. And well, as she said, she was on or beneath the social minimum for a long time building projects that we all use. Yeah. And that's at this moment, there's still there's some projects fully funded, which I contribute to, some projects partially, and some projects unfunded. I still work on all of them. So how can you help? It's not necessarily about money, but it, it could be one of the things. But how do we find out where to help? Well, first thing to do, if the project has one, look at the contributing guide or look at the documentation to see if there's an on-ramp for contributing, or if there's particular things the maintainers ask for help with. If those things don't exist, what about just asking? Yeah. Why not open a ticket and say, I'd like to help. What do you need? And I want to urge you to look at your own dependency tree, at the things that you use in your whatever it is you do and which open source software is part of that, and, and which one you can help. And it might not always be the most obvious ones that need help. So look a bit deeper. Look at all these projects, and, and, and look at who is this? Look, Who's behind this? Look especially at those wh which you normally don't think about because they just work. Yeah, things like WPCS. Adding a funded contributor to a project can often be a good idea, but it can also be hard. The thing is, if there is an overworked, underfunded, or unfunded maintainer, uh, and you say, OK, I want to help the project uh, as a company, so we're just going to put someone on that project and let them contribute to it, you are now basically overworking that maintainer even more. Because that maintainer is now basically expected to train your employee for free. So yes, please ask them whether that's the kind of, of contribution which is needed in the project, a new contributor, or if that's only welcome in combination with funding. Because the funding might allow the maintainer to then actually review those PRs without getting even more overworked. So we've had nine topics so far. And eight of them are the responsibility of the maintainer in some way. Money is only one of them. But it is the one that outside contributors can help with most easily. It is also the one that facilitates more time for the other eight. And some of you might now say, hang on. but..." Joost, you build a successful business around your open source project. Shouldn't all open source maintainers do that? Well, A, not every open source project would do well as a business. And B, not every open source maintainer also happens to have come on this earth with business sales and all the other skills required to actually build a company. Every time, every minute, an open source maintainer needs to spend on building a business is basically time which is being cannibalized away from the open source project. And if they do build a successful business around the project, 
nobody's funding the open source project except for that, their own business. So it, it's still not a healthy relationship. So this only truly works in the long run if every company contributes and resources are divided in a meaningful way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in WordPress, we have the Five for the Future project. Yes. Which is awesome, except, yeah, again, how, how do you contribute your 5%? And where and how and, and what? And there's definitely companies, and, and I'm just going to call one out here, but there's definitely more, like Automatic, which actually take the responsibility and take it seriously. They do really contribute to open source in every single way they can see fit. But we can't just look at Automatic to solve this for you. If all those companies making money of WordPress and of the dependencies of WordPress, why should one company take the responsibility for all of it? That's not healthy again. And when we're talking about this, I think it's really good that we realize the size of the market we're talking about. I think people don't realize what these numbers actually mean. 3,000 people here is a lot. It's also like one 100,000th of a percent of the users we have. We're not talking about thousands of euros or hundreds of thousands or millions. We're literally talking about billions of euros being made off the top of WordPress. And a lot of these companies have very healthy margins. And you might go, hey, I'm not making that much money. And others might go, yeah, we can do that. <coughs> But without giving back to the software that this all depends on, we're actually, well, we have a problem. Oh, well, your business is built on quicksand. So who should we be giving our money to? Good question. If I knew and if I could solve that one. <laughs> um, there's a lot of open source projects that need help. And the, the fact that long-standing contributors to open source, people that we both have known for years and that have been doing a lot of work are still looking to get funding and, and can't really realize that is on all of us to make sure that we fix that. And, and it's, it's painful to say because these are the people we all rely on and they have to fight to get funded. Why should they have to put in that effort while that effort and that energy could be better used actually making the open source project better again. So luckily we are not the only ones talking about this. There are companies like Tightlift, Fangsdev, and even GitHub sponsors. Yes, correct. That allow you to look at your dependencies and find the, the projects that need help. Unfortunately, this doesn't work well with WordPress because WordPress, well, doesn't use Composer the way it's supposed to be used, etc. Because, yeah. <laughs> There's small, tiny problems. Yeah, but it's still a better starting point than none. And this is where we want to talk about, OK, so how do we talk about this in companies? Companies often throw this sort of funding of open source under their corporate social responsibility. Which is also, unfortunately, the thing that gets cut first when, well, margins are thinner. And that doesn't really work, does it? Definitely not if you're the WordPress contributor who gets cut. So we've talked about Five for the Future for a bit. I've, I, it is a good way of thinking about it, but it's also Maybe it's time we give you a lesson on how to sell this to your CFO. Yeah. One thing that you are always talking about is we should change the wording. Yeah. If we, if we talk about donations, if we talk about sponsoring, we're basically talking about giving away money. That's not something a CFO wants to hear. If we just change the wording to funding, that's already a different proposal. 
Vocabulary, words mean a lot, and they carry meaning, they carry weight. Funding is perceived completely differently than donations. So that's the first step, but there's more. The harsh reality is that your dependency tree is a house of cards. The tree that we always use to display these things is probably a wrong thing to display it. It looks way too stable. <laughs> Basically, if you knock over one of these cards, everything falls down. Imagine and tell this to your CFO, tell this to the CFO of your customer. Imagine if one of your critical dependencies would suddenly stop. And yet there may be a hundred forks who would try to continue and then it will still die in a year's time. If you need to replace that dependency in your whole stack, the, the sheer effort, the sheer money needed to refactor your complete application might bankrupt your company. This is what we're talking about. This is the house of cards. So you basically have an unmitigated business risk. And this is language C-level uh, people understand. This is what you should be talking to your CFO and other people about. We have unmitigated business risks because we don't know that our dependencies will actually keep on working. And as soon as you turn it into that recognizable shape for them, they can also start to think about how to mitigate their other unmitigated business risks. And this is where Juliette and I have fierce discussions <laughs> on how this should work. Because Juliette likes to talk about it as insurance. Basically, the way I see it, if you have like a company building, you insure it when it's not on fire. If you use open source and your business relies on it, depends on it, builds on it, needs that to succeed, you fund open source when it's still working and being maintained. Same like with an insurance policy, you have no guarantee that there will be a payout or that the project will continue. Same like with an insurance policy, it does not buy you a seat on the board of directors of the uh, insurance company. So it doesn't buy you influence in the project, but it buys you a much bigger chance that the project can successfully continue and be future-proofed. So this is where it shows that, I, that A, I'm a socialist, and B, I'm a European, because I think that we should solve this with taxes. Unfortunately, we still don't have a global government, so I... Yeah, and it's, I know, it's the Star Trek something. world I want to live in really doesn't exist. Um, but there are good examples of this happening already. Germany started a sovereign tech fund to fund open source. Unfortunately, Germany is just one country. It's a pretty big one, but it's, we can't rely on that one country to fund open source for the entire world. But, this, but taxes is the way I think about it because what, taxes are what we've used throughout the world to fund the maintenance of a common good, which is what open source is. And, well, maybe we have to get creative. And this is actually, to a degree, what we ask of you. Get creative. For now, each company has to step up individually. Maybe at one point we'll get to do a presentation like this to the European Parliament and fix that. Who knows? Please reach out to, you, uh, to us if you want that. So basically, we're near the conclusion. If someone can please explain this to me, like I'm a five-year-old, that would help so much. This was very near to actually happening in much harder ways than people realize. The European Union was very close to actually having laws that required QA and security pr protocols for every software uh, solution out there. 
that we can, just can't have as open source communities because these, we're, we're not that professional and, and set up. Luckily, the WordPress Foundation, together with Drupal, Joomla, and other uh, foundations worked, and that law got changed, although it's still got stuff about vulnerability disclosure programs that you need to have for your open source program that are actually not necessarily easy. No, and, and think of it this way. An unpaid overworked maintainer would now, for some, in some way, have to find the funding to defend themselves in a lawsuit about some, not complying with the European law, which is actually in violation with their, with their license. Uh, excuse me? This, making laws like this, which will put people on trial who have, don't even get paid, let alone have the funding to defend themselves, there's something so fundamentally wrong about this. So, maybe we should talk about this differently. Maybe we had this thought as we were discussing this. We should make our hosting companies <coughs> Are tax collectors. Every WordPress in a site that out there is hosted somewhere. If every hosting provider would sell, uh, put some of the money they earn on the hosting towards the open source projects which are run on their servers, that would be great. It would be a good start. And not just WordPress, also Joomla and Drupal and Laravel and Symfony. All of it is open source. But we're not going to solve this. We'd love for you all to help us figure this out. So our challenge for you during this WordCamp is please keep talking about this. Start, you know, in the coffee break, during lunch, start talking with each other about this subject. Start brainstorming. Start thinking about creative ways we can actually fix this. Because if we do not fix this, we will have a serious problem with open source in 10, 15 years. So we need to start the change now. And it's up to us to start that change. It's up to you to help us start that change. And with that, good luck. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> We have a little bit of time for questions. Um, we have two microphones to the left of me and to the right of me. <laughs> we already have a question. Um, sound. Can, Can someone turn this mic on, please? Can you turn on the mics for um, the... Oh, yeah. Hello, yeah. friends. Uh, so thank you very much for what you have shared so far today and the inspiration that you have both been. Um, I am so thankful that you are speaking so publicly about the need for a lot of this. One of the things that I have been doing, so behind the scenes, I help make possible some of the funding that Juliet is receiving from my employer as well. Um, and I want more data to be able to provide, you know, why we need to continue this work, why we need to continue funding open source. One of the other areas that I have started contributing to outside of WordPress is related to SBOMs. And for those that don't know, that means software bill of materials. I'm wondering, in the open source world, so a software bill of materials basically does the dependency chart. If you go into GitHub and look at the dependencies of the open source software, it lists this big, long JSON file for you of all of your dependencies. Have you found tools or other open source projects that are really making it visible the dependencies that we have upstream. So all of our languages, all of the little tiny libraries like why can't we upload our plugin zip files this week? Or why is the email not going out? Have you found a way to see more clearly than just that big SBOM? And are other projects elevating kind of what else they're dependent upon? Well, we mentioned Tightlift and Thanksdev, which are both projects and, and also open uh, GitHub sponsors we all use that dependency tree, that, that stack, to help you find the projects to fund. But it isn't very visual, it isn't very graphic, I agree. There's definitely better tooling which could be built there. Yeah. So if someone wants to open source a project and do it, 
please do. <laughs> Thank you, <Julia. laughs> I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Are there any more questions? I'm sure you have some, so don't be shy. Walk Hello. up to the mic. Hi. Um, well, the part about uh, the fact that you said money is useful, great. Thanks for the realization. <laughs> Second thing I liked was uh, the fact that you said you need our help to figure this out. Um, the first thought that came to me was uh, I live in India, but I walk around in Italy as a local by using a, an app, the Google Maps. And if Google came to me and said, uh, can you pay me a dollar for the entire year? Yeah. I'd be saying, yes, thank you, because you're making my life so, so easy. Then it says, uh, pay me a dollar a month. I'll be very happy. And that's about it. License the damn thing. What's the problem in licensing? The problem in this is that most open source projects aren't the, the, the front end user facing interface on your phone. You're not, you don't that, have to license it to end users. You have, use, you have to license it to the people who use it. And they'll be happy to pay a dollar or whatever the reasonable number it is. And the whole problem will be solved. We'll have a much bigger conference next year. Let, let, let me, well, having built a company that has software that's used by 13 million something users and seeing that about 1% of them paid for it, uh, that's the harsh reality of licensing. And the other people part are not willing to pay. And the other part is people just don't even realize they're using open source. They're so used to surveillance capitalism where people are used as the product. Everything is free. You are the product. We'll sell your data. That people can't even imagine that open source does not get, uh, collect your data, that open source does not sell your data, that open source is not making money. It, it just doesn't come up in people's minds to realize that they actually need to fund these projects. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's loud. <laughs> Do you have one question? That will be our. Um, please keep it brief. <laughs> I'll try to keep it brief. Fantastic talk. Really enjoyed it. it Got into areas where we don't often talk, but are very important. And tax is a very public. Uh, okay. How? What do we need to do to change the way that WordPress, as a community, engages with other open source projects in the community? And I say this in the context of someone that I've done uh, Mozfest, and this is great. And it's very, very different to Drupal events and then Linux events and Apache and stuff. But it feels like we'd have to come together to make this work. So what would be good next steps? Well, step one is for you all to go to not just the WordCamp, but something else for a change. <laughs> <laughs> Spread the word. I, I mean, I, I love WordCamps. And WordCamps are very good. But I agree with you, Ant. We, people should. Well, we should talk to more people, and, and we all should be in more of these communities. Yep. And there's relatively few of us that actually go to other things. Although it's, it, it's getting bigger, but it is, yeah, it's important that we do that. I agree. Un, uh, unfortunately, we have to uh, cut it off now. Um, thank you so much, Joost, Juliette. Thank you all for listening. Oh. And please keep discussing. Okay.